I'm really happy to be here. This is the first time um, Western campus. So thank you all for um, welcoming me here. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. I come from the University of Windsor. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in Argumentation Studies. It's an interdisciplinary program. My area of research is on critical thinking, and so I approach that through the lens of argument and argumentation. Uh, I also work in our Center for Teaching and Learning as a curriculum project coordinator. So we're going to be talking about uh, criticality, critical thinking, uh, through the lens of complex adaptive systems, as well as uh, through the lens of active inference. Is anyone here familiar with active inference? Carl Fiston. Yet to find someone in person. But what we need is we talk about what can you expect. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit about critical thinking, talk about active inference, which will lead us into a discussion of complex adaptive systems. And then I'm going to attempt to connect this conception um, that I'm, I'm attempting to engineer uh, with the existing literature on critical thinking. Um, so the state of the field. Uh, the field of critical thinking is in a state, uh, a mystified state, where no single definition of critical thinking is widely accepted. And it's not that we don't have any definitions. In fact, we have a lot of definitions um, and varying definitions. And for some of these, there are sustained charges of bias and efficiency. And bias, particularly in terms of promoting uh, dominant and very narrow conceptions of rationality and rules. And I think part of the reason, at least, um, that we find ourselves here is because we lack a robust theoretical framework to orient the field, um, the foundation that would justify and enhance our approaches to fostering critical thinking. And so uh, Kevin Posen, I think, is justified in lamenting the descent of the critical thinking movement into a chaos of mushy definitions and curriculum. So what am I doing about this? Um, for one, I recognize that there is a need to understand thinking in order to understand what critical thinking is. Um, and concisely, I regard thinking as an inferential activity. And so I often use the language, um, as, as John Dewey did as well, of critical inference. And I'm not interested in inference as a product. And depending on what discipline you come from, it can be seen as a product. And uh, my home discipline of argumentation studies it is often uh, regarded as a product. My interest is in focusing on inference as a complex uh, dynamic process. So, so we, uh, John Dewey summed up the power of thought by quoting John Stuart Mill and saying that to draw inferences is the only occupation in which the mind never ceases to be engaged. Um, more concisely, Paul Thagard um, offered a neuropsychological view of thinking as complex and multidimensional described inference simply as the activity of forming mental representations, such as inferences. So I will use the language of critical thinking. I prefer the language of critical inference and uh, in research and trying to engineer this conception of inferential criticality. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention about inference more generally is that there is pretty strong consensus in, uh, among neuroscientists that the functional level of our inferential activity Perception, cognition, and emotion are intricately woven together uh, with each other, but with our active engagement in the world. Um, often we can think of perception as an inferential process. We can think of cognition, we can think of emotion as an inferential process. Um, but ultimately, these are woven together deeply. And there are also uh, multiple conscious and non-conscious elements that are spread across the brain, the body, and the world. And I think already this is starting to set the stage for viewing inference through the lens of a complex adaptive system. So I'm proposing that the active inference framework proposed by neuros uh, neuroscientist Carl Friston is particularly promising for helping us to understand this phenomenon of inference. It's an approach to modeling learning and decision-making both in biological and artificial systems. And it's seen in a significant explosion of application um, within a very wide uh, variety of domains over the last decade or so. I'm particularly interested in its flexibility and its comprehensive approach to modeling various cognitive processes and this relationship between action and perception, thereby bridging neuroscience, psychology, philosophy of mind and cognition, and drawing on principles from statistical physics. So it provides a functional and mathematical perspective on how organisms interact with their environment. At its core, active inference rests on a robust quantitative foundation 
It's founded on this principle of a variational free energy. I don't want to go into a discussion about uh, the free energy principle today. I just wanted to mention that it really has this uh, robust formal underpinning. This framework also takes a dual or um, bi-scriptive approach in that it aims to provide a descriptively plausible account of how an organism engages in inferential activity, as well as to indicate what optimal inference entails. The central idea is that organisms are continuously making predictions about their environment and adjusting these based on experiences. This adjustment process is known as belief updating and involves reducing surprise or uncertainty um, within this framework also understood as minimizing prediction error for free energy. But it reduces this uncertainty um, essentially in two possible ways, either by revising our internal models, thinking our, our mind, our expectations, our models of the world, or by actively engaging with the environment to better align our experiences with our predictions, with our expectations. Um, so sampling a different data set. Essentially, our brain is constantly generating and updating predictions about sensory inputs, when there are discrepancies, right, this leads to prediction errors and signals and need to adjust our understanding or our actions or perhaps some combination of these. Now, part of the value of the framework is that it goes beyond perception and extends to all aspects of behavior and implies that our actions are not just for immediate needs, but are also uh, geared towards gathering information and reducing uncertainty, not just current, but even future uncertainty, and thus refining over time our understanding of the world. One of the framework's most intriguing aspects is how it addresses this exploration exploitation uh, dilemma. And this is the tension between exploring uh, on one hand to gain uh, more knowledge and reduce uncertainty. We can think of this as epistemic foraging. And on the other hand, exploiting our existing models or beliefs to make decisions that are expected to yield immediate benefits. And we can think of this as pragmatic foraging. Exploitation is about acting in a way that maximizes the expected advantage of these actions based on current understanding or beliefs. And exploration involves actions aimed at reducing uncertainty and improving the accuracy of our internal models or beliefs. So active inference, the, this framework dissolves this tension by suggesting that our actions are inherently serving both purposes, balancing the need to gain knowledge and achieve practical outcomes. In a stable environment, we might lean more towards exploitation using our established models for decision making. But on the other hand, in novel or uncertain contexts, exploration becomes more common, right? focused on gathering new information and refining our models. And this balance is key to adapting effectively in diverse and changing contexts, enabling organisms to thrive by dynamically adjusting behavior based on context. And it's this inherent balance that within the active inference framework that I think provides a normative framework for understanding optimal inference, suggesting that the best decisions are those that maintain a balance between stability, exploiting our, our known models, and flexibility, exploring new information. The idea is that optimal inference will simultaneously maximize information gain to enhance the accuracy of our internal models, also known as self-evidencing, while also minimizing prediction error to limit the surprise and avoid undesired or improbable states. So under this framework, we engage in this behavior that is uh, both uh, simultaneously explorative and exploitative as needed, right? We need to be able to adapt to both the familiar and the unfamiliar. So I think that um, in the absence of a more robust theoretical framework, that active inference provides a really powerful lens through which we can uh, understand learning and decision adaptation integrating various um, insights from disciplines, various disciplines, and uh, providing a comprehensive model for understanding the subtleties and complexities of our inferential activity. And in my research journey, uh, this understanding of, of active inference is what provided a sort of conceptual gateway into the domain of complex adaptive systems. In fact, uh, Miller et al. described active inference as, quote, a new physics-based modeling approach apt for the description and analysis of complex adaptive systems. So now I want to um, explore how our inferential activity can self-organize, adapt, and evolve in response to interactions within an ever-changing world. We focus just on a, a few aspects of complex adaptive systems. When it comes to complexity, you know, human inferential activity is inherently complex. It involves numerous interrelated elements, for example, 
sensory inputs, memories, immunological factors, social influences, and so on. And these elements interact. The inputs are not directly proportional to the inputs. The simplicity that we see in humans, I think, mirrors the characteristics of complex adaptive systems. In terms of feedback loops, right, where the system's output influences the future behavior, um, and this feedback mechanism actually contributes both to the system's adaptability, but also is a source of its inherent uh, unpredictability, potentially leading to emergent phenomena and behavior that can vary significantly in response to minor changes in input or conditions. And I think likewise, our inferential activity is embedded within an intricate and fluid web of feedback loops. For instance, we can think of contextual factors, prior knowledge and experience, values, communication and argumentation, logical influences, technology. There are multiple sources of both internal and external sources of feedback. And these feedback loops shape our inferential activity, but they're also shaped by them in return. And I think this resonates with the broader complex, uh, sorry, context dependency of the system. In terms of adaptation, our inferential activity is continuously adapting as a result of con uh, collective interactions and feedback loops among its components. Uh, and this adaptation is key to learning and decision making. This notion of self organization. Uh, is focused on the ability of a system to structure itself and form emergent patterns or organized behavior without a central control mechanism or external direction. Um, and so regarding our mind's inferential activity, we might say that it demonstrates self-organization and how thoughts and ideas and understanding emerge from the interactions of multiple factors. Um, and in regards to emergence, emergence is often considered in relation to self-organization. So. Pulling this idea uh, further, we might say that human inference exhibits emergent properties that vary in scale and significance, right? So we can think on the one hand of simple organized thoughts, we might think of more complex uh, concepts and ideas, um, but we can also think of, you know, creative insights and breakthroughs, which these, you know, of course, are not directly traceable, for instance, to individual cognitive, perceptual, or emotional processes. And my favorite part of complex adaptive systems that I want to talk about today is criticality. Um, itself is emergent, uh, an emergent phenomenon and often described as edge of chaos or edge of chaos criticality. The idea here is that a system is characterized as operating within a delicate balance between structure and flexibility, between rigidity and laxity, between order and chaos. And a system is observed to be most sensitive to changes when it is at or near criticality where small perturbations can lead to larger system-wide effects. And I think a really interesting example of the significance of criticality is observed in both healthy and pathological brain dynamics, as well as altered states of consciousness. Um, and within this, this literature, it suggested that there are various advantages to operating in a critical region, uh, not necessarily poised directly at criticality, but near criticality. Um, and these advantages include optimal transmission and storage of information, optimal computational capabilities, and maximal sensitivity to highly diverse stimuli. And there are some scholars that highlight that measures of criticality may serve as general gauges of information processing capacity and offer a framework to model understanding, uh, model and understand, sorry, cognitive functioning more generally. So my research is really focused on how inference can be seen to demonstrate uh, these common features of complex adaptive systems. So nonlinearity, feedback loops, adaptivity, context dependency, and self-organization. And I think that we can draw on this notion of criticality in trying to make sense of how critical inference emerges um, and has this sort of adaptive function. You know, really tapping into the account of the active inference framework, I'm advancing this notion that our inferences are most optimal most effective and adaptive when they maintain a balance between, on one hand, uh, the adherence to our existing models, stability, and on the other hand, an openness to new information, flexibility. So we can think of uh, critical inference as a dynamic activity of optimizing our belief models based on evidence, right? integrating information in a way that calibrates our existing beliefs with the evidence we encounter in the world. And I think ultimately that this boils down to this notion of proportion, proportioning our beliefs to the evidence. Um, and this notion of proportioning our beliefs to evidence is uh, a prominent idea in the critical thinking literature. 
So active inference offers insights into the mechanisms of inferential activity and complex adaptive systems provides this sort of broader lens through which we can understand how our system of inference uh, manifests emergent properties. And I don't want to go into this for the sake of time, um, but I, I just want to say that this active inference framework also provides a mechanism for understanding how false or delusional inference can arise in the process of minimizing uncertainty. For instance, when this balance between our predictions and the information we receive is off. Um, and maybe if it comes up in the questions, I'd be happy to sort of give an example of what that looks like. Um, but that said, I think it's really important to recognize the varying implications of context dependency because maladaptive inference in one environment may be adaptive in, in another. And so my instinct is to side um, with uh, cognitive philosopher and scientist Andy Clark in arguing that there is no singular correct balance. He says that uh, there is no balance such that the balance will always reveal how things are because it all depends on the kind of world you happen to be living in at that time how volatile it is, what's going on there. And so there's no right answer as to how this balancing act can be done. So last minute here, um, I wanna look at how does this conception of inferential criticality align with the literature on critical thinking? And I think it, it does in, in pretty interesting ways. Um, these are not all of the ways, but I just to, to give us a, a taste of what this looks like. Um, I think this notion of criticality is what best aligns, uh, particularly that prevalent emphasis we see in the literature on balance and this role of proportioning our beliefs to the evidence. Um, and interestingly, this language of criticality, um, the field of critical thinking has already been moving towards this language, albeit not in the way that I am proposing. Um, there is been an effort to combine the strengths of critical thinking approaches with critical pedagogy approaches, a critical pedagogy focused on uh, challenging power dynamics and promoting uh, social justice. But this effort to combine these um, happens under the, the joint uh, notion of criticality. So I find it interesting that the field is already moving towards that language, um, but it's in a different sense from the, the sense in which I'm proposing. There's also um, a significant uh, emphasis on describing critical thinking as being self-correcting, self-directed, self-regulating. And I think this aligns with this notion of, of self-organization. Um, there's a strong emphasis on the adaptive function of critical thinking. And there's a strong emphasis on context dependency when it comes to critical thinking. And finally, there is a, a lot of literature that looks at this relationship between uh, critical thinking and systems thinking. So just as a final note, uh, I'm gonna end with this quote from Willingham who notes that critical thinking is not just you know, a set of skills that can be deployed at any time in any context, but it's a type of thought that even three-year-olds can engage in and even trained scientists can fail in.